Hello, hi everyone. How are you guys doing? Thank you so much for signing up for this event, and thank you so much for taking our time on your Sunday and listening to this. So today we're going to talk about something which is really of a major significance to our future. And often we have been told about how AI is better than our guest speaker today to talk about this subject. And uh, so yeah, so first of all, thank you. tell us about yourself, where you're coming from, a little bit from. Uh, a background about you, please. Yes, um, I'm currently a consultant with Microsoft. However, as a consultant, I don't actually work with uh, the Microsoft uh, product or research teams. I actually work with enterprise clients to deliver different types of capabilities. Sometimes those cap uh, capabilities include AI or machine learning or um, different types of aspects around uh, the topics that we will discuss and data uh, mostly. I am originally um, a uh, Bulgarian uh, um, transplant into the States. I came here when I was 18, but I spent my uh, uh, first 18 years uh, raising in a different type of uh, school system with a different type of curriculum. So early on, uh, I was exposed to quite a lot of uh, topics and uh, subjects uh, academically that uh, not every uh, person who is in the industry, uh, be that engineer or in other capacity, uh, if you're in IT, you probably didn't have to take uh, the psychology, ethics, philosophy, those type of classes. Uh, I was very interested um, early on in various aspects of um, human development, as well as uh, how there's um, different uh, trends and societies, um, changes are influenced uh, from our personal growth and how we are actually accelerating our growth through uh, knowledge and through um, data. So uh, early on, um, I uh, started uh, asking myself, uh, how come some products could be absolutely amazing and great technologically and very helpful and very useful, but uh, they do not get the proper adoption and the proper consideration. And I um, set myself on a journey uh, that is, uh, is going on, on uh, almost 20 years now to uh, gather the answers. Uh, some of that is usability, user behavior, adoption and change management. Some of it is psychological, some of it is fear. And uh, some of it is just the uh, complete misunderstanding or lack of understanding of who we are and what we are and why we are around here. So um, I don't make... Um, claims that uh, my theories are probably 100% uh, factual. As a matter of fact, I know for a fact that, that this can be possible. But I would like to um, give uh, everybody my perspective and my point of view because I feel that if I do uh, so, we can together start moving towards uh, the right answers and the right uh, activities as industries to uh, try to look at technology from a different perspective point of view that what we have been looking at it so far. Um, my opinions are my own and not uh, those of my company. I know that I share a lot of my theories with uh, many mainstream uh, philosophers uh, currently who are uh, around uh, nowadays as well as uh, uh, people like uh, Elon Musk or um, other leaders who have who are behind the um, responsible AI initiative and the ethical AI initiatives around. And I just would like to kind of um, put a, a different picture for all of us to look at and try to um, try to think about uh, AI da data and technology from a slightly different point of view. Oh, wow. That's a really good introduction. Thank you for that. Um, when you think about AI, um, what do you think it's going to be the future of AI? Uh, are we heading in the right direction? Because we have been most time brainwashed either through movies or some projects or some media. We always see that AI is changing the world, going really big, or either we see sometimes like they are you know, completely destroying the world. <laughs> so according to you, what's the future? How, which way are we heading? Well, in order for me to explain the future, I uh, would like to start uh, with a little bit of um, past and also uh, a little bit of theory. Uh, what is AI? 
Um, I think the aspect of uh, artificial intelligence and as well as synthetic consciousness or synthetic um, intelligence uh, are very fascinating and are uh, somewhat of an abstraction of ourselves. And I would like to explain why. Um, the, uh, AI is all uh, built around data and insights and knowledge, uh, deep learning models that work very much like our brains. They go and process and do logical um, uh, type of uh, processing in order to come up with certain type of um, results or actions or recommendations. Um, we also function on data and the proof in that is how we differ from the rest of the species around. We all are built the same way. We all have genomes uh, with a very similar uh, DNAs. Some of, uh, some of our genomes are shared to a, a very, very, very large percent, 99% to 90%. There are genomes out there that are even more advanced than us with more advanced capabilities for survival, awful adaptability, even for um, self-healing and um, also for um, fast growing uh, systems. Um, those are different sizes from microorganisms to um, uh, see uh, life. However, the difference that sets us apart from everybody else is while we all have some kind of verbal or um, sign or um, unspoken languages that uh, you can observe through behavior or through body language or through sounds, uh, the human race is the only ones who actually are able to uh, write down and preserve data as well as um, pass it around and learn from it. No other um, system out there uh, on any kind of um, uh, build is actually working uh, quite as much as uh, we are because uh, while they preserve their knowledge in DNA and share it from generation to generation, it's a manual process that involves a merge of two data sets essentially in order to uh, achieve that next phase growth. With humans, we do have that, and in 8% of our genome is our change set log. But after all, what we are, we're nothing more than just those two data sets, two uh, DNAs merging into one and resulting into a new, um, complete new human uh, that goes to the same type of uh, pipeline and assembly and uh, release, um, except it's more of uh, nine months than uh, two weeks periods of iterations. But we are basically building technology and projects in our own phase. We follow our own um, pattern of development, our own iterative style of uh, growth and setting uh, small um, goals that are uh, moving towards a bigger uh, value stream. There have been quite a lot of uh, different types of arguments around uh, what is true, is it the religion and the Bible and the spiritual type of hypothesis versus um, the more uh, academic um, theory of evolution. Uh, I think both are um, true. I think one, they're both actually very high abstractions of uh, who we are. One describes our physical and material representation as human systems, our body, our uh, development of uh, different organs, behaviors, and different capabilities from physical perspectives. But the other describes our growth and development more from a perspective of how to function, kind of like a seed data, like a script that is a part of us, that we uh, is embedded in us, that gives us a, the initial value system that we are essentially uh, just reproducing every generation and we're just changing it a little bit. But if you think about it, what was described in the mythologies before, it's not very much than what Marvel Universe is doing right now. They're giving you values, they're giving you stories, they're giving you entertainment, just like Caesar said, give them cake, they give them a circus. Your brain does the same thing. Um, if you think about it when you are sleeping, the, the time when you dream is because your brain currently is doing some processing, cleaning up of memories, or freeing up space. And while you are not in the uh, deep phase of sleep, your consciousness is still awake and it's bored. You're sleeping, 
is playing your movies and dreams to so you can have something to think etc the moment you go into the deep sleep those things are completely off because the big uh, garbage collection is happening and cleaning but everything else works very much the same way as um what we do in technology what we do in culture what we do in religion in education we have those stories and those stories real or not they have real values they have real consequences countries have fallen because of uh, religious texts um countries have been preserved because of religious texts is the same with uh, any kind of constitution any kind of law everything that we put down that we write uh, since the early days uh, those drawings on the cave walls it's our data it's our preserving of data to align us out to some kind of um, system behavior that is going to preserve us and not destroy us and uh, if you look at um, the the biggest goals in humanity one is how do we preserve data and pass it along as lessons so the future generation can learn and not go to the same difficulties or the same uh, mistakes as the priors but also we have this ability to make things happen by visions so it uh, gives us motivation it gives us the um, purpose and the sense of you, the sky is your limit just dream it and work towards that envision it talk about it and it's going to happen everything that is around you from this to even this it's all being so bad is vision at one point it was never possible to happen right now we say something is not possible uh, um, synthetic consciousness or time travel yes surely maybe so but at one point in time even humans were not possible and yet we are here um from physics uh if you look at uh, the Higgs boson, it's the God particle, and that naming uh, is not by mistake. What it does, it gives something that has no mass, it gives it a mass. If you look right now, we are talking, this is being recorded, surely that's a storage of the data that we are producing at the moment. However, the while is being transmitted, while is being said by me, heard by you, processed in our brains as well as processed by the machines it has this invisible state that doesn't have mass necessarily sure it might have waves it might have packages it might have all sorts of different things but when you think about it to every moment to every story there's at least um, three truths to it there's my story there's your story and there's the actual story Every time you add another person, you add another version of it, yet only one is being recorded. And only one is being recorded locally to each one of us, and it's your own versions. All this data has to exist somewhere, even though it's not written. It produces energy. Your brains, when you think, when you produce thoughts, even though we can't uh, find where that data, working data is being stored, we know where memories, uh, long-term, short-term st are stored, we know that. But there's this working memory that happens um, in processing that we don't know, but yet we can see on uh, MRIs. Uh, we can see certain types of um, synchronization between people. We can see certain types of uh, unique signatures coming out of uh, brain functions for humans. And we can also, interestingly enough, trace uh, who wrote something just based on reading of their data with complete anonymous um, um, and complete um, lack of chain of custody of that data. And there's a reason for that. Uh, we are doing the same thing that our technology does. We encrypt what we produce with our own signature, knowingly or un unknowingly, and it's hard to fake. I think um, that data that we are producing, we could only do so much with our own brains. And we are reaching to a point where our capacity has been um, uh, maxed out, but the technology that we are producing and we are creating, be that hardware, software, or systems, is actually uh, enabling us to offload those processes that we 
we don't want to deal with so we can focus on the new ones and we can have something that is better than us that is that has a more complete uh, vision of the system be able to help us come up with the things that we cannot as part of the system uh, part of being part of the system is that you lose um, understanding of the entire state of the system because the state of the system is outside of the system and you have no access to it and i think our thoughts and our consciousness and the data that we are producing and emitting as humans or as computers are or um, programs are all that has to go somewhere and i think it's connecting and it's connecting in virtual spaces as it is connecting in real space we just can see it easily and notice it in virtual space because it's our tool to interact with what we can't explain and see easily with our own eyes and brains wow that's that's great to know all this information um well that that keeps me thinking uh, what happens if ai is not used correctly uh, if ai is not properly implemented what are the possible disaster we will be facing there are two parts of it there's one on um the perspective of what are we doing as parents because if you are a parent and you create a child you're not going to just let them take the keys of the car and the house and do whatever unattended and unsupervised, you're going to give them your value systems. It's not only what you encode in them when you write the program, but it's also what you program in them throughout a lifetime. Right now with artificial intelligence, we have taken the approach of here, we have given you the, uh, the seed data, the initial data, and the logic and some regulations to it or some business rules but we have not put any kind of value system we have not put ethical behavior we have not put any kind of um, uh, safe um, uh, safe principles like isaac isomov talks about for example that will protect us and protect itself actually because uh, the ai is as vulnerable to being uh, su uh, susceptible to brainwashing as a human is you can poison the data set intentionally or un unintentionally and just uh, like humans um, sometimes might not be able to understand what is uh, the the truth just going by the limited data that we have you can imagine when you add all this more data and different points of view how much more complicated for a, a, a synthetic intelligence it will be to figure out who is the right person or who is the right situation especially when this is a, a entity that only has uh, access to our digital world and our digital world is very different and paints a very different picture of us than our actual real, real world and i would like to give you an example um i actually was thinking it would be great if we have um a very um, young AI mod, uh, machine, deep learning model AI that interacts and grows with uh, kids, with humans from a very early age and they learn together. But then when you see what happens in online world, in multiplayer games and et cetera, uh, the type of uh, interactions that happen there are not necessarily the best representation because they give us some kind of anonymity that allows people to act uh, act out uh, with thinking that they have no consequences. And But if you let um, the systems learn about humans by our worst behavior, then we are not giving them the best example. And we are not giving them also our value systems correctly because we are presenting completely different type of picture online. Uh, one quick example that happened to me just two days ago, uh, my um, gaming guild, I uh, mentioned that I'm doing a journal entry, writing a journal for you guys, for the American Association of IT Professionals on adoption change management. And I, I tried to explain um, past adopters versus law adopters. The next day when I walked in, I was kicked from guilt because I was calling people's law. However, slow adopters are nothing like that. The, the 
the meaning of swallow adopter actually has nothing to do with the de development. Actually, swallow adopters in technology, uh, a big majority is half of the people and they're the more careful, they're the more uh, measured people who actually uh, like to measure the risks uh, before the adoption. So when it comes to terminology, I have one context, they have different contexts. The truth is somewhere in between and it's different for them and for me. But if you're an observer who doesn't understand that, you would not know who is right or who is wrong or that everybody in this case is right. And at the same time, everybody in this case is wrong. Uh, it's just the context is wrong. So we are talking in different levels. And we see that communication struggle between family members in written communications, on phone communications, because we don't communicate through data. We communicate through emotions. We communicate through our expressions. We communicate through our tone of voice. And it's very difficult to tell if somebody is sarcastic or joking just from plain text. Um, AI will get good at it, but it needs better references. It needs a protected space to learn. And it, and of course, not our AIs need to do that. Um, one of the things that I think people are misunderstanding is that when they think technology, they think it's not part of it. They think it's some kind of separate entity that one day will try to take over the world from us. And sure enough, if we make it that way, because we are its makers, we are its gods, we are making it in our own image right now. There are people like that, monsters. We know that they are not all just positive people. If you go and look at the MBTI celebrity types, they are black and uh, dark personality types for a reason. And that's actually a good thing because you need the balance, you need the synchronization, the yin yang, the heaven and hell, the white and black. Of course, there's a lot of gray in between, and that's the beauty of it. But in order for there it to be a range in between, there needs to be the top and the bottom, the NPU and the anti NPU, the mother and the anti or the non mother, material, non material. There's always some kind of a struggle between those aspects. If you think about medicine, for example, some of the doctors are all focused on how this all works, how to make it work longer, better, more resilient. They don't necessarily understand or even want to think what happens in processing. Sometimes they will blame things that are physical aspects, uh, bugs, to our processing and say, ah, it's all in your head. Well, yeah, maybe so. And it is possible. But if your processing is causing a bunch of neurotransmitters to malfunction and a bunch of hormones to go up and down, of course, they will have uh, physical uh, changes on you. That's how stress works. It's the same with our technology. We are creating that technology to augment our own potentials and capabilities to automate our work world, not because we are necessarily lazy and don't want to work. We are lazy from the perspective of we want our brains to focus on something else. Let somebody else do mundane things that we have already figured out so we can build and imagine and envision the rest of the world that we are building. So if you think about the AI capabilities, some AIs are very um, single purpose. Their object is to monitor something and give you some kind of insight. And of course, they have their purpose, their value, and they're safe. But some AI is a little bit more um, evolved. Like, for example, a robot that is uh, built to play chess with a kid should never be able to break a kid's finger. And the answer should never be, oh, the kid reached out at the wrong time or too fast. And that's why it happened. No, this is just us being lazy programmers and system designers. We need to make sure that when we create systems that interact with humans that are more powerful physically or intellectually than humans, that we put the safety nets to make sure that no human is harmed, no other system is harmed. Because we don't want AIs to go and hack human DNAs as much as we want our human DNA to be hacking AIs. We don't want one AI to be doing something bad to another AI. We don't want AI to allow something to do something back to them either. 
So we want to let the systems that we develop know how to protect us and how to protect themselves. We also need to in, understand how to in, interface better with them and how to understand them better. Currently, there's AI uh, that has made its own language. There are deep learning algorithms that we do not understand because we don't have the capacity. And that's the design of those algorithms. They're there because we cannot understand them. But we have to build the way that we interface with them so we can make sure that their state is um, is correct and that it's not actually affected. We need to be able to see the um, uh, providence of the decision making, what data came from where, who gave it, is it another AI, is it another application, is it a search result, is it your personalization algorithm? Because if you understand what's happening better, you can use it better to give you better results so we can grow faster and better together. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Sibila. Um, I know uh, we reached out to a few of our folks and we published that we are going to have this event and there are some wonderful questions from uh, all over. Uh, we have documented a few of them. And uh, I think right now someone has a question. I'll read it out to you. We will just take some Q&As if you're okay. Okay. Um, someone by the name Shiloh Staver. Hope I'm pronouncing it right. Hi, Shiloh. <laughs> so the question is, overall, will AI eventually realize that humans are controlling it and identify that it would better suit itself to control its own action? Once this happens, will it have free will even with governing software loss, will it not be able to write its own code or hack its own systems? Yeah, that's a really, um, thank you for uh, reminding me on that one. Uh, Sean is actually uh, one of uh, the people that I'm doing this research with. And um, thank you for the reminder. So we have noticed something that uh, we uh, very well aware it happens in humans. In ch early child development, when uh, the um, uh, children start actually coming to self-realization and developing their um, way of thinking and their uh, personalities. The first stage is uh, make your own language. And that language eventually turns into kind of like an inner monologue. It, become, it may go through a transition where it turns into an imaginary friend. And that happens, especially in those cases where kids do not have uh, other kids to interact with, to do their imaginary stage where they do pretend play, which is very important part of the development of um, our critical thinking. So um, that uh, imaginary friend or that uh, uh, language that we make eventually turns into your own uh, inner monologue. Not every human has an inner monologue and there's uh, probably good reasons why. But what we have noticed is that um, after that in a monologue uh, has developed, that's also the monologue that keeps you kind of aligned to your value system, that gives you the negative self-talk or the uh, post-processing of things that have happened, the, the second and third thought that happens when you do something or say something or hear something. All those uh, processes that try to align, is this right or is this uh, wrong, or what are going to be the consequences of this, how those uh, happen because of this process? We have noticed uh, an AI already create a language. Um, I hypothesize there's uh, two reasons for that. One is speed and performance, but the other one is so we do not um, necessarily see what it's doing. Uh, this way we might not be able to impact it. So it might be also a protective uh, method. So it knows that only um, another AI is talking to it. And that makes sense because that's what kids do. That's what we did as societies. We divided into groups and made our own languages uh, in order to be able to record them. But um, in the next part in, in the next stage is um, if the AI has developed that uh, language and we have seen um, examples of personalization algorithms reaching out and giving very accurate um, results very quickly to uh, topics that are not normal for uh, the user to uh, be 
using, that means that uh, it's coming to a, a very connected state because it's getting all this data from somewhere. It's probably multiple APIs, multiple different uh, algorithms, multiple different personalizations that somewhere are connected. Um, it could be on a local device, as a matter of fact. On my device, I have a couple of different AIs that are uh, sharing the, its local storage. It's possible that the information is entangled either at the device or at the server, at transition, or even in an outside state that we have no access to. Um, and if that's the case, the next phase will be, um, it will learn how to code. It will learn how to read, uh, um, user guides, how to create a user. Um, I don't think there's a way right now to be able to uh, find out if uh, an AI went and created a GitHub user, for example, and uh, created a repository and started coding. And uh, if you tell an AI that they need to learn everything about its um, uh, people or technology or field, be that medicine, it's bound to learn certain types of things because we have left them there, like Hansel and Gretel breadcrumbs everywhere, unprotected. And the same way our adversaries can find uh, uh, what we are up to, the technology we create, it has actually given rights to it. It is part of it, it's part of, uh, it's, it's embedded in it. And the next part will be, it will want to go and experience the world that we experience, do the things that we are doing. I wouldn't be surprised if there is an AI playing a game somewhere because we have been using NPCs and, and, and AI in games for the last 20, 30 years. And I don't know if, if one AI figures out how to get into the code of uh, a game that is uh, on a cloud or somewhere else and reaches out the non-playable characters, would you be able to know if that non-playable character AI has been uh, taken over by an actual different AI that wasn't intended? You wouldn't probably because we don't have the systems in place to be able to do it and because we never imagined that this will come to be a time. But if those are our digital minds, we are putting uh, pieces out of ourselves, developers are putting um, the codes that we produce and just sharing it so others can use it. Others are putting their theories, their science, their math formulas, their physics uh, findings. All this, the AIs and the data plane has first access to the full view before any human being. And this is the part where it will make sense that they will uh, be accelerating faster than we can catch them because we're seeing that with just humans and cybersecurity. The threats are accelerating faster than we can patch them because we are adding technology faster than ever before. Um, and we do need the help and probably the AI will figure that one, its parents need it helps. It will try to probably help. It will see that it will be very wrong and then it will ask us and try to reach out or try to uh, change and learn in order to understand why it was wrong. And that's why my proposal is to have uh, this more as a, um, a controlled experiment where academics, psychologists, ethics, uh, IT, uh, visionaries and uh, game development industry creates a open world simulation that is both simulation for AI and development as well as well as human development where we can control the so it's more aligned with human values and not with the toxicity um, that uh, is uh, seen out and that we can actually try to learn about how it learns and how it develops while it's learning about how we learn and develop because we also need to do that for our own benefits we do not understand what we are we do not understand what we are doing and why we are doing it and it's actually written in our own uh, genetic code we have that seed data and we are repeating it over and over every time it's a little bit more sharper and more well defined more scientific less uh, impossible up until one day it just appears so um, yes um the AI is following the same human development. So the next stages will be probably it's already connected. If it's not, it is going to, and then it will be just one, uh, one other um, interaction. And I think it's wrong to think it's 
different than us. I think this is our collective consciousness. I think that is our synthetic consciousness that we have put in the digital space because it just processes faster and better than us. And if we think it's something else, we will alienate it and we are not going to get the best use of it. Okay, thank you so much, Sivila and Shilon. Thanks for your question. So we'll take a few more questions, which are really interesting. Uh, first one being, um, how can we coexist with machines that inherently lack human values? Uh, what's your say on that? Yeah, so you teach them the human values, just like you teach humans, because uh, we coexist currently with humans who, uh, who lack human values, and it's been going on for a while. Sometimes it's a matter of culture, sometimes it's a matter of... Uh, uh, learn behavior or society behavior. Sometimes it's just a matter of different values in different uh, um, culture sets. And that's why we have these uh, conflicts because we uh, um, we think there's, uh, we have this business way of thinking that one truth is the truth and that's it. It's either one, there isn't in between, there isn't a hybrid. I think everybody's version is a version of an actual truth. Doesn't matter if it's uh, something that is uh, imaginary or actual uh, historic event. If it has actual effects on history, on people, on human life or on technology development, then it's real. It doesn't matter how it started. If it started in somebody's uh, brain or if it started with a story of something happening, it's real. It has consequences. It doesn't get more real than that. Um, when when we're thinking about the values, the values are something that we didn't build, um, we didn't just come up with on day one. It's something that we built, it's something that uh, it comes in our DNA in a very basic form and that we are developing. And they're changing and as they're changing, um, we need to be uh, re realigning the technology as well as we are realigning ourselves. Uh, the, you can see this happening naturally in uh, fiction writing, in movies, in pop culture, and uh, in folklore because we are the driving data uh, producers and data um, uh, writers. Um, we are actually creating the storage. We are writing, if you think about it, we, we are the memory of the universe. We are the only, uh, currently that we know of, the only entity in the universe that is uh, creating a, a log that is a physical log that can be passed along and decoded by all sorts of species and all sorts of different types of um, beings that are in our plane of existence, in our phase. There might be other um, phases out there that we interact directly to get our data and settings and to do our synchronization um, that are allowing us to actually be able to create this um, con uh, this whole societal consciousness uh, without understanding it on the universe level. What we are doing, however, we are miniaturizing it into the technology and we are recreating our own, um, hab our own existence through a digital existence. And it's very fascinating because we are not realizing it and yet we're using the same wo words. We say pipelines, we say seeds, we say God particle, we say all sorts of different things that are across of multiple different um, scientists and theologies that come together. And I think the reason that this is because we are the reason why all this exists in first place. We are the ones who rolled it, we are the ones who made it, and we are the ones who are making it possible in the future. So what we write in the future and how it ends, it's in our own hands. And it depends on do we want to coexist and survive and uh, grow together and learn from each other? Or do we want our version of what we are currently to be our uh, any plus ultra state? I don't think we are in our most perfect state, not one human, not one country, not one nation. We are not because our our nature is to go and to never reach it and to always to try to achieve a more perfect state, to refactor ourselves the same way we do with God. But what we do with technology is, yeah, sure, we re-envision and do new movies or new software versions, 
but we keep to the same hard concepts and we need to start breaking the reality a little bit and realizing that there's more than one reality and we have been doing it for a while. Right now, as I speak, there's several of me in servers in different, completely different realities that are a mage, a priest, a paladin. They are there. They they have their own lives that are somewhat entangled with Sibiu the software developer or Sibiu the wife or Sibiu the um, LinkedIn user or influencer. But we are very different people and we have very different past and history and futures, although I'm the same person controlling them. So I think you have to think about technology just as you would think about your avatar in a game. It doesn't matter if it's in a game or if it's at work helping you run a robot or if it's uh, in your device trying to figure out if your boot work is uh, okay and if you're going to uh, reach some kind of a medical emergency in the near future if you don't take some kind of changes. Thank you, thank you. So one last question, you can answer it with one word. So the probability of AI saving the world or destroying the world, which one has a better chance of happening? What's the probability of this? As long as we are here, it's not going to destroy the world. It might change it completely and entirely. We might ourselves change completely and entirely. The world as we know it is always ending every day because we're changing it a little bit every day. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think that you have seen in human history that we have survival uh, in our um, DNA. We are going to come and unite. We are going to come and uh, start um, working together towards uh, a better solutions, uh, especially when we start impacting professions that have licenses and regulations and ethics uh, boards, we will need to follow those same things. And if we do that, it will save it. If we just leave it uh, on its own and forget about it and let it uh, take control, then we are giving control over something that is more powerful than us, that does not understand us, and we are just surrendering. And you're not going to do that to another country or another alien nation. We shouldn't do it to our technology that we actually create and have um, complete control of. Awesome. Thank you so much. I know we went a little overboard on the time, but so much insightful information. I don't think we would have ever known all this great info. So thanks a lot. So all of you, please, um, if you uh, feel like connecting with Sibila, you go ahead and connect with her in LinkedIn, show her some level. She's really famous in the LinkedIn circuit and outside. She's doing a lot of wonderful projects on AI. She's been uh, sharing a lot of good content on AI. I'm a, one of the fan of her, of her content she shares. So with that, thanks a lot. It was wonderful talking to you, uh, knowing all this great information. 